So, good Wittgenstein will be covering three parts. He, first of all, will look at his life, um, at his sort of little bit of background in terms of life and um, biographical details that are um, that are interesting to know when doing his philosophy. In the second part, we'll look at the first of his major works, which is called uh, Tractatus. The full name is Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. It's a tract. It's a it's a it's a treatise. Sorry, it's a treatise about um, philosophy and logic. And in there we see the picture theory of language that he came up with, that he proposed, um, how this work was interpreted by contemporary thinkers, contemporary acad and academics, contemporary philosophers as well, um, some criticisms that that work had. And then in part three, we will look at his other very famous work, very influential work, which is called Philosophical Investigations. And this is the later sort of part of Wittgenstein's life. In fact, if memory serves me well, um, the Philosophical Investigations was actually published posthumously. Um, but it would revolutionize, once again, um, the philosophy of language, it would revolutionize the way we look at meaning, what words mean, how meaning works, etc. So that will be today's lecture for us. And uh, I'd like to start, first of all, by sort of giving a bit of an exposition on his um, on his life. So he was born in Vienna in 1889. If you look online, you'll find pictures of him as a young boy. And you'll also see him in what seems to be like a classroom photo. One of the people in there would also be an Austrian, born again in 1889, like him. Um, but one we know now is Wittgenstein, Ludwig Wittgenstein. He'd go on to change the world in terms of his philosophy. He would be very influential on a lot of fields, a lot of disciplines within academia, not just limited to philosophy. The other guy would also change the world a lot, but his name would be Adolf Hitler. And... It, 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 some say that they were classmates, but of course we know the end of one. We'll see it today the end of the other. Wittgenstein was had nothing to do with um, his classmate back then. Um, he turned out to be like a, a good thing, if one is allowed to say that. So he was born in eighteen eighty in eighteen eighty nine Vienna. And he was born in money. He was born in a wealthy family. And first he studied um, mechanical engineering, which would be a section of physics. And then he later shifted on to philosophy. His influence in this shift, the sort of the impetus that led him to this shift was his reading of Bertrand Russell and also Frege. We've, um, we've, we've mentioned and discussed these two figures. And he was interested in a variety of things. He was interested in music and architecture and given also his background in engineering and in physics, he was also interested in aeronautical engineering. Now keep in mind that at this stage in the late 19th, early 20th century, you, you didn't have airlines as you have today. You know, the flight was in its very early infancy and he was um, interested in this as well. Now, in terms of um, philosophy, he would be influenced by the Vienna Circle, what is known as the Vienna Circle. He then um, uh, will look a bit into that, and also by early analytic philosophy. We've mentioned um, we've mentioned Frege, we've mentioned Russell, as you know, these two figures 
are important figures in 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 analytic philosophy um uh, he moved to cambridge at one point and this would be his exposition this would be the sort of the the, the main influence on his academic life in terms of his philosophy moving to cambridge and cambridge remember it's a it's a british university and there is this distinction between continental philosophy nietzsche um people before nietzsche as well you have kierkegaard etc um uh, but also later philosophers of, of, of from a continental tradition had this interest in metaphysical issues had this interest in existential issues as contrasted with british philosophers who would be more analytical the approach of analytic philosophers towards language was uh, towards philosophy was that philosophy's big problems um who am i is this real is there such a thing as justice what is art etc rather than being true metaphysical problems true philosophical problems they were problems of language so it was seen philosophy was seen or at least these problems which are very important problems in philosophy were seen as problems of how to go about meaning how to go about the meaning of words what do words mean if i ask what is justice my solution according to analytic philosophy would be to analyze the word somehow perhaps see um, trace its its roots and uh, see what the dictionary says and that will be guiding me this would be part of my sort of my my journey towards solving the problem of what justice is something like perfection something like um, beauty something like what is the good um, um, these were considered by analytic philosophers therefore problems of language once you solve the linguistic problem behind a question such as what is justice what is good what is a good person once you solve the linguistic problems behind that you will also then also um figure out the, the philosophical problem of what being a good person is so as perhaps the direction of this lecture so far shows or at least um, i'm i'm trying to impress on you is that therefore according to analytic philosophers philosophical problems are a waste of time unless we tackle them analytically we analyze the terms we lay out the terms we explain those terms we see what those terms mean and also the processes that lead to the meaning of words once we sorted that out we're done when it's a fake it's a false problem um these would be false problems false philosophical problems problems like justice definitely um, goodness etc anyways so wittgenstein um born in 89 by the time he was 15 16 you have the first world war and wittgenstein served in the austro-hungary austro-hungarian army during that time um you had the first world war fought between two broad camps as you may perhaps already know and the war started in 1914 lasted till 1918 and it was fought between what was the austro-hungarian empire and its allies including germany and what were then the allies on the other side in you know, britain and france um etc of course wittgenstein being born austrian was drafted in the austro-hungarian um camp 
side of this and you know the the experience of the trenches of the of the of, of the battlefield of being on the front um had an impact on his philosophy during his time in the war he would go on to write um quite significant portions of the um, tractatus of the tractatus logico philosophicus there then the war ended wittgenstein um, worked for a time as a primary school teacher um, here and there villages in austria etc and then he um, uh, eventually he returned to 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 philosophy his reason for teaching primary school primary schools here and there in villages was that he wanted to sort of he wanted to to find sort of practical and ethical engagement in um with ordinary life so he tried to see what life is really like out there um, um he had these experiences during this time that also influenced his views on language they influenced his views on education how do we acquire words for instance um uh, doing philosophy uh, sorry doing um, uh, teaching young children primary age children let him experience therefore let him see let him um, 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 study how we acquire language, how we use language, and how we make sense of meaning. After the war, like I said, he sought to, uh, sorry, after a few years of doing this, he sought to return to philosophy, and in fact, he went to Cambridge again in the late 1920s and um, based on his Tractatus, that book that he had started writing during the war, based on that he was awarded a doctorate, so he, be he became Dr. Um, Ludwig Wittgenstein then and um, uh, through this move, this move to Britain, this move to Cambridge, etc. He became um, one of those main figures in British analytic philosophy, despite the fact that he was originally from the continent. He was Austrian. Um, but this move to Cambridge, of course, opened doors and also opened um, subsequent generations of philosophers to his influence. Now, let's look a bit at what he says in the Tractatus. And, like I said, the Tractatus was his first published work, his first major work. It's considered a masterpiece. And despite the fact that in his second work, or in his second phase, the investigations phase, the philosophical investigations, phase he would sort of revise and he would go against his own statements in the first half of his career despite that fact the book the work is still a masterpiece it goes into um, um, things like the picture theory of language and um, it goes into um, um, logical form it goes into propositions for instance it it it, it speaks about the limits of language and what can be said linguistically etc and if you had to see it if you had to read the investigations you would see that it's quite um it's quite particular it's quite um uh, it's it, it, it's written quite peculiarly in fact let me read you. Let me read you the first um, uh, few f few lines of this. Um, uh, 
you'll find this you'll, you'll find a copy of this you, you'll find it from from bookshops of course but you can also find it online for free now enough time has passed that it's been um it it's it falls within public domain i'll share the link with you as well now th th these are the first few lines of the book so the world is everything that is the case line one and these are all numbered so one line one the world is everything that is the case 1.1 1 .1. the world is the totality of facts not of things 1.1.1 1 .1. the world is determined by facts and by these being all the facts 1.1.2 1 .1 for the totality of facts determines both what is the case and also all that is not the case 1.1.3 the facts in logical space are the world 1.2 the world divides into facts and this goes on this goes on for quite a while um, basically he's talking about this distinction between facts and things and the distinction between facts and things is something that you know pertains to language as such but it's also um it's also it's also sort of delves into the distinction between what we use to describe things and the objects themselves right so if we talk of things we're essentially talking of objects in i don't know a glass of water right and those things would be considered sort of what is what is the world made of we usually think ah the world is made of objects you know they don't have truth value to them true truth value to them um a glass of water is neither true nor false now if i say the glass of water is broken now that is a um, um that is a statement so there you find the distinction between objects in the world and how we speak about those objects and this distinction already starts to bring about um, uh, facts as a combination of things that are arranged in such a way that, that they become meaningful. So when I make a statement like the glass of water is broken, then I'm saying something that starts to make sense, linguistically of course, but you can gain information out of that. You can gain you, you gain data, but you can use that data to make to turn you can turn that data into information just the word glass of water doesn't mean anything you need context to that and the most basic way how to give how to turn that into therefore something meaningful is to turn it into a fact so facts would be like bearers of truth because they can be true or false right i make a statement i give you a fact and then you decide or, or, or of course it has to be an informed decision but then you can decide whether my fact is true or false and um, so so we start to see how facts can be fairly complex as well because they can be composed of a number of things they can be composed of multiple concepts say the glass is broken 
uh, the, or the glass of water is broken, is made up of a number of concepts. You have the concept of a glass, something that in nature, on its own, doesn't make much sense, perhaps, because it's us who invest meaning into that, into what is a glass. A glass is a holder of water for you to drink from. If there is no you, there is no glass. Essentially, there's some object, but the fact that we call that object a glass is a result of us using that to make a fact. We turn the artifact, we turn the object into a fact. So, things in themselves, being the, uh, sorry, I was, I was talking about um, how facts are complex, right? So, if the glass of water, again, water, what is water? Well, water can be a substance, right? Any substance, but what makes water? Water, for us, is the fact that we have a relation with water. When we think of water, there's a lot of things that come to mind, perhaps even subconsciously. But think of water, think of any other liquid. I don't know, it's a surgical spirit. We get different vibes from that. Why? Because we get different meanings from those two very different things. So what makes water what it is, you know, the thing that rains, the thing that we need, the thing that we drink, and um, which helps life to grow. And if there's too much of it, it's not a good thing. So, and if, even if there's too little of it, it's not a good thing. But all these things that we sort of, that, that, that come with this object in the world, start to take meaning when it becomes a fact for us. Um, you know, the, the concept of broken, what is the concept of broken? There's no such thing as a broken thing in the universe, really. We think of things as broken because we process those things through how we think about the world. Um, uh, anyways, so you have this relation between these objects or between these concepts that we turn into facts, and that relation for every thing that we say is um, is, um, is 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 specific. It's specific to that statement that we're making. So, just to quickly refresh. So, truth value, right? Things in themselves don't have truth value. They just, um, they're, they're constituents, perhaps, of facts, right? Facts, which are these statements that we make, um, which are made up, they're complex things that are made up of things, you know, the glass of water is broken. Together it becomes a fact, which can then, which we can then parse as true or false. Um, facts, on the other hand, um, like I said, as opposed to things, facts in themselves are essentially tied to truth values. Um, uh, they assert something, they make a statement about um, how things are arranged in the world. And according to Wittgenstein, then, they have a role in language, they have a role in logic. And at this point, Wittgenstein thought of language as something that mirrors the world. So you have the world out there, right? Um, uh, and then language mirrors that by depicting facts. So this leads then 
to um, his picture theory of language. And those four, five verses I read to you, um, let's tackle them bit by bit. So the first line, the world is everything that is the case. What does it mean? It means that um, uh, it, Wittgenstein there is trying to, you know, posit a definition of the world in terms of facts. The world consists of all that is true, right? Or the case, everything that is the case, everything that is true. That's what it means. Um, so reality is not just an, a collection, an aggregation of objects or entities or whatever, but it's somehow, it's fundamentally constituted by facts. So you have specific arrangements of objects that happen to be true. So the world is everything that is the case. When I say that everything that is the case, what, what do I mean by that? Like I said, that, that is true. But we already know, but we've said that for things to be true or false, they have to be facts. Because things in themselves are neither true nor false. I can make statements about things. The glass exists. The glass doesn't exist. And that can be true or false. But the glass on its own, the object on its own, is neither true nor false. I have then to put that into a fact for it to become true or false. So, the world is everything that is the case. The world is everything... The world is made up of facts, essentially. So, the, then comes the second line. The world is the totality of facts, not of things. And now, in the second line, then he is introducing, then he's finally distinguishing between facts and objects, between facts and things. So, things are constituents of the world. And the world itself is constituted by facts. Then... And you have different configurations for different facts. And again, this, um, this, this emphasizes that understanding the world, for us to grasp the world, we have to grasp the facts that pertain, that are related to how things are arranged, to how things are interrelated. To understand the world, it's not enough to make a catalogue of things that are in the world. To truly understand the world, we need to see how things come together in the world. Once we understand how things interact, how things are interrelated, how things are connected together, that is the true understanding of the world. It's not just compiling a list of things. If you want to understand the world, you have to have a wider grasp of things. You have to see how things connect together. So again, the world is the totality of facts, not things. By world, of course, he means uh, the world for us. Let me move on a bit. And um, because this forms the basis of the picture theory of language for Wittgenstein. In fact, he tells us that propositions um, are, can be considered as pictures of reality. So when we make statements, when we make propositions, when we assert something, what we're essentially doing is creating a picture of reality. We're using language as a means, as a way to map the world we're using language as a means to make an image of the world, to create an image of the world that, in such a way that we can then navigate the world. That we can, how do you navigate something? By understanding it. You can't navigate a place. You have no, you, you, you've no idea how to, how, what, what, to make up, what to make of. To navigate something, you need to understand it. 
or at least understand, you know, this road leads there, okay, then, then you can navigate consciously, safely. But to do that, you need to understand it. To, you need to understand, you need to understand the place you're in, you know, if I find myself stranded in the middle of some European city, remember Paris, right? I have no idea where, um, where I am, so what do I do? I look at my maps, or I look at landmarks, but that, again, it starts to give me a grounding. I can then travel the city. Um, likewise, in the world, unless I'm able to make sense of the world around me, unless I'm able to make sense of um, reality, so to speak, I won't be able to navigate that world. So I need language to help me do this. So language, therefore, maps the world, helps us map the world. And the structure of the world is mirrored by the logical structures, the logical structure of propositions. So statements mirror the structure of reality. What is logical structure of propositions? When we do logic, we talk a lot, quite a bit about form. Um, uh, we know that if you have a proposition followed by another proposition that is related, we can get to a conclusion, we have syllogisms, and these, these are things, these are structures within logical arguments that help us gain insights, help us learn meaningful things. Um, and we're able, we're able to understand, we're able to make sense of logical structure because it follows logical form. And what is logical form? Logical form is the underlying structure that both propositions and reality share. So reality has a logical form. Propositions, that is language now, when you use language, also has a logical form. Of course, the logical form within the world is what lets it be, what it allows it to be what it is. The logical structure, or the logical form in language is what allows us to make sense of that world, of that reality there. And Wittgenstein, therefore, concludes, tells us, that language can therefore only express facts about the world through its logical form. So the only way for language to give us facts, to give us statements or propositions that by, by definition can be parsed as true or false, is through logical form. And then, sort of, once we understand, once we start seeing the world the way Wittgenstein sees it, then sort of a question arises, and sort of, are there limits um, to what can be said? Can we express just about anything? Can we talk about just about anything? And it's an interesting thing. Um, it's an interesting question, and the answer is even more interesting, <laughs> because Wittgenstein concludes rather famously, in fact, you can find this quote popping up often um, whenever you're looking up philosopher quotes, this quote comes often, even sometimes misnamed as someone else's quote, but whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. So. That about which you can't talk, you have to be silent. If 
you know, if you he closes the Tractatus with this in his Tractatus Logical Philosophy, because in the in his seven point zero, like I said, every statement he says is numbered. Well, seven point zero is the conclusion, and um, he says this: whereof one cannot speak, therefore one must be silent. Um, and it, it seems to be pointing towards the limits of language. To be silent is to be is to not use language. Is not is, is to not say words. One when one doesn't speak, when one doesn't say words, of course, one is tacit. One is being is being silent. One is not expressing anything. One is not making propositions. Um, so. How can we interpret such a such a statement? First of all, it seems to be a statement about the limits of language, right? Um, uh, so there are aspects of reality, there are aspects of experience um, or value. Sometimes w when we talk of value, sometimes we use it to mean ethics. You know, what is ethics? It's, a, it's, it's about values, essentially, or even aesthetics. Um, uh, once again, the value of art, what is art, what is beauty, etc. Um, or what is the sublime, um, uh, or the mystical as well. People discuss the mystical. So there are things um, uh, that go beyond the natural. We call this the supernatural. Or in spiritual circles, sometimes they're called mystical. The beyond, the, 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 you have theological things, you have spiritual things, etc. But when we talk about these things, therefore, you know, um, aspects of reality, aspects of experience, tasting strawberries, how do you put that in words? How do you explain to someone who's ne never tasted a strawberry what it's actually like? You can approximate it. You can say, ah, but tasting a strawberry, the texture, if it's um, you know, it's not ripe, it's quite tart, similar to oranges-ish or other berries and the tartness about them. But once they're really ripe, they can be really sugary, um, really nice and crisp, but soft and juicy. And then, But what about the taste? How can you explain the taste? And also, you know, referring to strawberries as tart or as crispy or as juicy, you're referring to experiences you can gain elsewhere in other fruit, but what if someone has never tasted the fruit before, or doesn't know what oranges are like, or doesn't know the meaning of the word tart, in terms of taste, of course, or sweet in that sense, how do you explain crispiness, or that level of crispiness, that is a bit mushy, if I'm saying this about strawberries, and you identify your experiences with, I think, ah, yeah, yeah, that's actually true, you know, that's what strawberries are a bit like, but you also have that grainy texture due to the seeds. You know, you can do that because you've experienced strawberries. If you haven't experienced strawberries, it's going to be next to impossible to describe that. So there are things like experience, also spiritual experiences or ethical experiences that can't quite, or aesthetic experiences, the experience of watching a sunset or a sunrise, you know, one of, the, one of those bellowing red sunsets and gorgeous with huge clouds or if you have a view of the sea, it's even better. Um, how do you translate that into words? What sort of words can you use that adequately describe these things? And when I say adequately, Imagine explaining these things to someone who has never seen a sunset. How do you explain that? How can you explain, again, how do you explain smells, the smell of freshly cut grass? Unless you've smelt it, it's really hard to explain. It, it, it's actually, um, uh, actually Wittgenstein says that it's, language is inadequate. Um, uh, you can't explain that through propositions. Um, why? Because we're talking about things that transcend the logical form of language. And once things 
aren't within the grasp of language, then you can't precisely articulate them. Their articulation, the, 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 the wording of them, the way to put them into words, into propositions, into statements, eludes us, escapes us. So that's one way how to interpret this um, um, this thing where whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. If you can't, if you don't have the tools to speak about God, therefore shut up. If you don't have the tools to speak about love, therefore shut up. If you don't have the tools to speak of b beauty, justice, um, um, the sublime, the beautiful, the, the, the ethical, therefore you should be silent. Um, a second way how to interpret this harkens back a bit to analytical language itself, analytic philosophy itself, because analytic philosophy, as we've seen, has taken upon it to prove, or at least to, to state, that the problems of philosophy are false problems. The problems of metaphysics are false problems, or of ethics, or of philosophy of religion, or whatever, of, of philosophy of art, of aesthetics, etc. They're false problems. Why? Because they 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 ask the wrong sort of questions. What we should be after is um, what we should be after are the problems of language. Therefore, the philosophy of language is the true, the real center of philosophy. Philosophy should be concerned with language. It's a very scientific approach. Um, um, anyways, um, so another way how to look at Wittgenstein's statement is to see, is to see it as showing, as demarcating, you know, outlining the scope, the extent, the breadth and width of meaningful philosophical inquiry. So philosophical problems um, arise when we misunderstand the logic of our language. And the role of philosophy should be to clarify these misunderstandings to help us better understand those limits and therefore questions that lie beyond <clears throat> um, what we can meaningfully express through language should not be the subject of philosophy we shouldn't speculate about these things about these questions about these topics why because they can't be addressed in a meaningful way for us to make sense of the world According to the tractate, so for us to make sense of the world, we need facts. What are facts? They are things that we can then judge as true or false. You can't judge God exists as true or false, or God doesn't exist as true or false. In fact, you have key figures arguing that it would be a mistake to to think that you can somehow prove God's existence. Why? Because God is beyond reason. God is beyond rationality. So an exercise like Thomas Aquinas's, the five proofs of God's existence in his Summa, is a meaningless exercise. It, it's just, um, it's just digging a hole in wet sand. You're never going to get anywhere, essentially. Um, uh, so the Tractatus had this um, had um, was seminal, like I said, and it had influence on, for example, the Vienna Circle. I've mentioned the Vienna Circle a couple of times at this point. This was a group of intellectuals. You had philosophers, you had scientists, you had mathematicians. As the name suggests, they were based in Vienna. Um, uh, they developed, they promoted as well 
logical positivism. Positivism is already a sign of a type of scientific approach to thinking. Logical positivism is an approach that equates logic with a science and positively sees that discipline as offering us meaning, very meaningful, very insightful answers to philosophy, to language, to questions that we have. Um, and the Vienna Circle itself was a form of um, analytic sort of um, approach, had a sort of analytic approach to things and they had this rigorous approach to trying to understand the world. Um, like I said, they rejected metaphysics. This would be something that would then, it would be a torch then carried by the analytic philosophers like Russell. Um, they would reject metaphysics. Um, they would um, um, promote what is known as the unity of science, the idea that you can that all sciences, all the sciences, whether it's physics, chemistry, biology, maths, even logic and philosophy, um, share some sort of common language, and they also share a methodology between them. So the scientific method should be applied successfully to other fields um, and the role of philosophy in such a case in such a unity of the sciences the role of philosophy would be to clarify language so the sciences should share we should aim to unif to, to unify the sciences and we do that also by making them share a common language but since we're talking about language, who and what deals with language best? Philosophy of language. And what sort of philosophy of language deals with it best? Analytic philosophy. Um, so, therefore, this is how they saw... This is the role they saw for philosophy. Um, Later in his life, Wittgenstein reflected quite a bit on what he wrote and uh, he ended up rejecting um, some of the things he said earlier in his career, um, in particular in the Tractatus. Um, he was especially against, he became especially against the idea of a language that is perfect enough to mirror the world. So, like we've seen in the Tractatus, he claims that language mirrors the world. How does it do, how does it, do it? Because it's facts mirroring objects. Right? It's through facts that we learn the world, that we understand the world. There's logical form in the world, there's logical form in language. That logical form wraps around, it mirrors the logical form in the world, the logical form of objects. We know what the world is like because we discover those relations between objects through the relations of the words that refer to them in language. If I say there is water in the glass, of course I'm making, I'm speaking words, right? There, you have to know English, be conscious and be aware of the meaning of those words in particular to, to give that meaning. So essentially it's, it's a linguistic thing I'm creating. Now I'm creating what? I'm making a statement. Um, I'm making, I'm, I just created a proposition. But 
that proposition actually mirrors things in the world. Water refers to some object in the world, glass refers to some object in the world, fills also perhaps refers to some state in the world, perhaps the state of this object, of this liquid object in this concave-ish other object. And that is a relation that sort of mirrors that. Now, in the in, in, in his later life, in his later academic life, um, he would critique this thing. Wittgenstein wouldn't be happy with this. And he shifts, and this is very interesting, very important. Wittgenstein shifts his view of language from the structure of language, from form, from uh, logical form, to use, how we use language. It's a very important shift. Um, uh, it's a very important shift. Um, uh, because now, when we discuss, when, when he starts discussing use, he's discussing the function of language rather than the structure of language. Now it's about function, it's about it's about you know the, the pragmatic aspects of language how we how we use it so meaning he states later is derived from how we use words in specific contexts he calls these contexts language games so no longer now is language there to picture facts about the world no longer is it there to give us an impression of the world to give us an image of the world but it is now about function it's about usage how we use words this is the meaning of words if i say water in the tractatus sense the meaning of water derives from the fact that you can have water as an object in a glass perhaps in the world now when Wittgenstein revises that and he says that the meaning of words derives from how we use terms now water the meaning of the term water comes from how we use it so if I say the word it, if I say, for instance, the, the word water, because someone asks, what would you like to drink? And I say water, that has one meaning. But if I say, if I say, if I exclaim the same word water, right, in front of a nine month pregnant woman about to give birth, that meaning changes completely. It means she broke her water, it means the baby's on the way, rush her to the hospital. So again, the meaning of a word depends on the use. And this is something that later Wittgenstein brings in. Um, uh, once again, it's about the context. It's about this language game, what he does. So let's look a bit more about um uh, language games and also his um his interesting family resemblance the idea of family resemblance this is how um how words gain their meaning so first of all language games um uh, language games is a term that he uses to describe the very many different ways in which we use language, in which we use words, in which we use expressions, um, the, the contexts of things. So a language game refers to any form of language use. 
of course, there are still forms of language use, right? But this is a different type of form than what we said with logical form. Logical form was about structure, the structure of, 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 uh, of what I'm saying, the structure of an argument, etc. Now, when I use the, when I say forms in this sense, we're talking about how we use language. And how we use language is shaped by, for instance, rules. It's shaped by conventions. It's shaped by contexts. Um, uh, and these surround particular activities. Particular activities have, bring with them different meanings to, diff to the same word. So, what he's driving at, at this point, is that the meaning of words is not fixed, but varies according to their use within, you know, within those specific sort of um, life practices. Some examples of language games. Um, giving orders can be a sort of language game, describing an object, um, telling a joke, you know, sarcasm. When we say things, but we don't really, we're not really saying those things, we're saying the opposite. Irony. Um, uh, there, with them come different and specific contexts in how we are using these. Um, so the way we say something literally versus the way we say something metaphorically or ironically or sar sarcastically or sardonically um, or cynically, the way we say these things is dependent, therefore, by these rules, these distinct rules, these distinct conventions, by the context. And for us to understand that context, we have to be inside the joke, we have to be inside the language. A joke works as long as there's someone who understands it's a joke, right? If, if no one picks on the fact you're telling a joke, it stops being a joke. Why? Because it's the use that gives it its meaning. If I make a statement, that statement gets, it mean gets its meaning on the way it is used. Um, so, again, we understand things because there are ways in which what we say is governed by distinct rules, by distinct conventions. And whoever's participating in that specific language game, in the particular language game, has, you know, it, 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 it has to understand. Otherwise, it, 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 the, otherwise language falters. Language, we use language to communicate. If communication is not happening, therefore that language game is failing. Now, another term that later Wittgenstein uses in his investigations especially is forms of life. Forms of life refers to shared cultures, shared historical social practices that we have, because these things provide us with the backdrop against which then we can participate, we can partake in language games. To be in on a joke is to be part of a group. That group would be the background against which jokes work. To be part of a group who understands the joke, that is, right? Um, to understand, I don't know, um, 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 Good Friday procession, we have to be in on what it means one assumes, you know, to understand what Christmas is about, we have to, to know what Christmas is about. To understand, likewise, um, what uh, the Chinese burial is about, or, or a Hindu 
Um, cremation is about we, the best way to understand it is to be in on those historical and cultural and social practices to be on in on this context it's to have the backdrop this allows us to understand what's going on um, this would be defined by Wittgenstein as the forms of life so then Wittgenstein uses this to um, um, to to emphasize to impress on us that language use is deeply embedded in forms of life and we understand linguistic expressions we are able to interpret linguistic expressions because our understanding our interpretation is shaped by specific forms of by our form of life and um, uh, forms of life are also related to language games in a sense um, uh, language games focus on specific uses of language within particular activities like i said you crack a joke on something it's a specific joke you you understand it because it, the people understand you because they are in on the joke they're part of the game or if you're playing um, tennis or you i don't know maybe you can like serve or you know people understand you because they they know understand the rules of tennis they understand the rules of the language within tennis therefore they understand what it means etc um, but it's specific, more or less. Language games are quite specific. They have specific uses within particular activities. Um, on the other hand, forms of life are about wider social. They're about wider cultural practices. You can have language games because you have forms of life forms of life make language games intelligible they give they make sorry they make possible meaning in language games they make language games meaningful now i'd like to move on and introduce yet another very important term by Wittgenstein and that is the concept of family resemblance and the concept of family resemblance is in a sense Wittgenstein's way how to explain concepts that can be related to each other without sharing a single essence or perhaps a set of characteristics and family resemblance can be taken imagine you have um, imagine you have a family right let's say you have a family of five so you have um, um, two parents let's say you have a mother and a father and you have three children let's call them one two three um, uh, genderless for now so you have two parents and three children the mom the dad the three kids and the mom has say curly hair she wears glasses has um, curly black hair nice blue eyes and i don't know she has slim features the dad has um, um, blonde hair brown eyes etc now the kids as you know if you have any idea of any basic very basic idea of how genetics work it's a lottery and you will get any mixture of genes from previous generations displayed in those children now let's say that you have one child who has blonde hair and blue eyes the other child three then has curly dark hair and brown eyes they look nothing like each other so if you see them on their own you'll see that 
they look nothing you know they don't they don't look alike so you you would think ah but these are not really related well the way to know that they're related the way to see the line between them is when you see the wider picture when you see the wider context and you would realize that the one that has blonde hair got that from the dad the blue eyes come from the mum so you start to build your widening your field the other child who has brown eyes but curly dark hair the brown eyes she got from the dad the curly brown hair she got from the mom you start so you start to see ah these two don't look alike but one of them ah you know what her hair really looks like her dad's her eyes really look like her mom's and the other one really has her mom's eyes but her dad's hair so now you start to see that there's a connection there that is when you start to see family resemblances that is how therefore family resemblance works um so it's um it's it's his way it's wittgenstein's way family resemblances it's um it's his way to challenge categorization um it's a way for him to challenge essentialism of language when we do philosophy of language we see that there are two approaches to language to traditional approaches to language one is the essentialist approach one is the conventionalist approach and the essentialist approach harking back centuries tells us that there's a direct relation between language and the world when young wittgenstein tells us the world uh, sorry um the facts mirror the world the logical logical form of language mirrors the logical form of nature what he's doing is he's giving us an essentialist version an essentialist reading of how language works there's a there's a link there there's a direct link they map onto each other language maps us onto the world right language gives us a correct version of the world sometimes it's wrong yes but uh, it's 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 a question of interpretation rather than a the, 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 rather than a, than a than a foundational problem with language when it's wrong that is now with the investigations wittgenstein is telling us that uh, but actually the way words work is not that they mirror reality but it's how we use them through family resemblances why does the word game mean so many things how does such a simple word the word game we you know we we think what is a game ah it's a game between two people perhaps what about solitaire ah it's you're on your own so okay so between one or two people what about football ah you have 22 all of a sudden plus the referees and plus this and that and the coaches and the reserves and what about a game ah but but you still have two sides no more or less but again let me remind you what about solitaire you're playing on your own what about a rubik's cube is that not a game um and then you say oh, so we start to see how games are quite a wide thing and we start to understand what games are by looking at them more holistically rather than thinking that the word game has some specific meaning we get a better understanding once we understand that the definition that the meaning of the word game depends on the context in which it is being used it depends on the language game so the word game itself is subject to language games if i use the word game when i'm talking about the game of football it's one thing if i use the word game when i'm out hunting with the royal family then it takes on a different meaning you know if i use the word game in a um, um, 
role in an, in an RPG setting, it has one sort of meaning. If I'm using that, if I'm attending a bullfight, um, it has yet again a different meaning to it. So again, it's for him to this concept of game is for him to under to, to, to for us to better understand um, um family resemblance and once again games themselves games are not language games now games themselves um there's such a vast variety of games we Notice that you can have board games, you can have card games, you can have ball games, you can have Olympic games, and so on. And for each type of game now, you can have different, you, you have, not can have, you have different rules, different structures, different purposes. Um, the rules of tennis are absolutely different from the rules of darts. And the structure of a game of football, again, is completely different from a game of chess. Um, even the purposes might be different. You can be playing a game of football, right? But the purpose of playing a game of football with your colleagues is one thing compared to playing a game of football in the I don't know I'm I'm not a big football fan but Champions League final the purpose is, is is different or in a World Cup game, right? So you have overlapping features. Um, so what helps us understand the word game is that despite this variety, despite this um, um, the, the, these differences. But we can recognize them all as being games because of a series of overlapping similarities. So as we look at games, we realize that some games might be for amusement, right? Um, a Rubik's Cube, can you call it a competition? Well, not maybe you're competing against yourself, but at that point, it becomes a bit meta, you know, you're competing against yourself. And so perhaps game is better than competition. But if we're talking about a, 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 a snooker competition, then yes, the word competition fits in. The game of snooker, which is competitive compared to a game of um, solitaire. And some involve skill. World Cup final, FIFA World Cup final involves high level of skill or, I don't know, Australian Open, whatever. Others, on the other hand, involve certain luck. A game of Uno, for instance. Some would have winners and losers and other games would be cooperative. If you're playing an RPG, role-playing game, you... you, you you know, you, you don't have winners and losers as such, because you can have teams on it, but you can also play it for, for the sake of playing it with friends, with no opponents, then. And so this would be more cooperative. Um, actually, an even better example would be something like, what was it called? Uh, Second Life, um, which would be a multiplayer platform game back 20 years at this point, I believe, um, where there were no tasks there were no goals it's still a game S people played but they just socialize and build things and this is more or less what it was it was a cooperative game there were no winners there were no losers there um, so the exact nature of these similarities and differences doesn't really follow a strict formula and this is key now because to say that there is a strict formula behind all games, to say that all games, absolutely all, bar none, follow a strict formula is to be making an essentialist claim. I'm claiming that there's something that all games have. Therefore, it's essential that all games have this thing. That would be 
um, that would be arguing that all games have a common essence. Therefore, that they are essentialist. Uh, the, the definition of games is essentialist. Um, uh, I understand. Sorry, something can be called a game, and I understand it to be a game because it follows a pattern that all games have, or or a definition or a formula that all games have. But Wittgenstein's argument now in the investigations in the philosophical investigations, and you will also find the investigations online. It should be at this point public domain. It's a fascinating read. I thoroughly suggest you um, you get your hands on it. There's the famous example of the um, duck that shifts into a rabbit depending on how you look at it. But I'll leave you to read that. Anyways, so what you have now with Wittgenstein's investigations is the claim that there is an absence of a common essence when it comes to games and um, there's no single essence there's no set of characteristics that all games must possess to be recognized by us as games instead this because we still categorize games right we, still, we can still categorize i know someone playing darts as someone playing a game we can still categorize someone playing football as someone playing a game or other things, or snakes and leathers, right? It's still, it's still a game, or Ludo, or Solitaire. This is also, the categories are still sort of there. We categorize things as games. But that categorization now relies on, um, on, on this, what should we call it? A network of similarities. You are now basing your categorization on things that are shared, on commonalities between things. So you have overlaps. Sometimes you have a lot of overlap. I don't know, rugby and football. Sometimes you have much less uh, chess and football. Um, but still, the way we arrive at them is that you have this web of connections just by picking out two objects sometimes you have a lot of overlap but sometimes you might notice that there is no overlap to arrive to that overlap you have to map a voyage and then you can say ah, okay so this is a game as well i see how now but again it's a holistic approach it's not an essentialist approach it's not defined by definitions it's defined by resemblances. And to have resemblances, you need to have a family of games. Um, so what does this imply? First of all, with regards to language and concepts, it shifts how we understand language and, um, and concepts, because it suggests that our concepts are not defined by boundaries. They're not defined by by edges, right? They're not defined by edges. They're not defined by boundaries. They're not defined by limits, but a sort of family resemblance. Um, you have a network of similarities and differences. Um, uh, you, you, we also are led to better understand categories. This whole idea of family resemblances challenges how we see, how we view categorization in philosophy. So now categories can be more fluid. We're not essentialist anymore. Now we can be fluid. We can be we can leave behind the idea that for things to have meaning they have to be strict, they have to be rigid. And instead, we can take on the family resemblance approach to the meaning of words. And we start then to see the fluidity between things. And I've said that this has its implications, right? It's, it's, it starts off 
as a problem within the philosophy of language. But the way Wittgenstein solves it provides insights that really transcend simple, well, not that philosophy of language is ever simple, but it's, it, it, tran it transcends a simple boundary. Now, this is a problem of language, that's it, we're done. What the family resemblance concept and what the language game concept gives us is, um, is, is a breakdown of categorization. And this then bleeds. Once it, once it breaks those boundaries, it bleeds into social sciences, it bleeds into the humanities, it, um, it, it, it bleeds into art, it bleeds into psychology as well, in, in cognitive science. Now it bleeds into anthropology, in the way we see society, in the way we think, social groups work, in the way we see races, in the way we see um, different groups of people. What we, we, We're in a better position now to understand how somehow everything can be seen to connect together. Because now ethnic groups, genre of art, um, if, you, if you study even cursorily um, the, history of, the history of art, for instance, you'll notice that the history of art is made of movements. And you start with the very, very early cave paintings and you go through the whole history of art. It's a millennia at this point. Um, we're stretching, you know, 40,000, 40, 50, 60,000 years at this point. But look at books of the history of art, especially pre-Wittgenstein, and you'll see that they give you the essences. They give you the differences. So this is um, the Renaissance. It was very different from the Gothic because now we have perspective, we have realism, we have, the, um, we have introduced more humanism, and this is very different from the A perspective depiction of holy figures in Gothic art or medieval art with their gold background. We're, we're given the differences. We're given what is essential for Renaissance art versus what is essential for um, for Gothic art, the, 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 when I say Gothic, it's the phase that came before the Renaissance. Once we are made aware, but of Wittgenstein's concept of language games, we start to see, we, we start to be also aware of how you could not have had Renaissance art, you could not have had Donatello, Piero della Francesca, you have Michelangelo, etc., without having the Gothic masters who slowly, eventually, through Giotto, through other figures, slowly merged, slowly moved there. It's a movement. Now you can see that it's a, they're all part of the same family. If you take late Renaissance and early Gothic, it would be quite different. But that, give, but that gives you a false vision of reality. Those two facts, the fact of what Gothic art, early Gothic art is, and the fact of what late Renaissance art is, doesn't give you the full picture. To get the full picture, you need to dive deeper. And now suddenly we see we see a bigger picture, therefore we understand better the world as is. Um, with Especially with the lack of um, um, common essence, etc. We don't need a common essence. What we need is that we recognize that all games must be recognized as games. Why? Because they overlap. All art must be recognized as art. Of course, categories still make sense. You know, we still need to categorize. As Aristotle said, we make sense of the world through categories. But those categories, now we see that they bleed into each other. And likewise, this goes for a lot of discussions. It goes for discussions about nationalism, about what makes someone black, for instance, versus white, uh, what the categorization that is very, very ingrained, um, um, very, very ingrained in us.
no, although nowadays is being chipped away the difference between man and woman you know between male and female perhaps is not that difficult but the difference between man and woman um is a categorization that is essentialist in nature when you have de Beauvoir then telling us that women are created when women are made right not born what she's doing is giving us in a sense a bleeding of edges now I'm saying de Beauvoir, we're talking about 40s, 50s, 60s. Wittgenstein would have been earlier, 20s, 30s, 40s. But what is happening there is again a breakdown of essentialist techniques in how we use words in favor of seeing things as more patchy. There's overlaps here and there. In fact, even even the notions of genetic essentialism, racial prof racial essentialism, um, it, it it might sound convincing to if you if you haven't read much, if you if you haven't been around much, if you haven't seen enough enough of a variety of of a variety of people much, but once you start seeing. Around, once you start looking around, you notice that there's different grades of how black you are, of how white you are. Does it mean that someone who is seven parts white and one part black is not white at all? Because you have this, you know, in certain areas, in certain places, you have this thing. If you are one out of eight parts black, you are black, not white. This happened with the Jews as well. Um, in, in Germany. Why? Because again, it's appealing to an essentialist approach to language, to an essentialist categorization. Family resemblances have this tendency to break down categories. Therefore, they can be seen as a more um, nuanced way, a more refined a more realist, perhaps, way of how to see things. Of course, um, of course, there are lots of things going on. There are lots of dynamics going on. You have politics that plays a part in how we interpret things. And there's, uh, there's, uh, there are um, um, peer pressure, peer influences, family influence, familial influences, societal influences, how we see things. But again, what we're doing now is breaking down those definitions, those barriers, those edges, to try and understand language better. I mean, uh, what, what, what I find fascinating, and I'll wrap up at this point, what I find fascinating about Wittgenstein is that he introduces a tolerance for ambiguity. So essentially what he's giving us is a recognition of how complex language is how complex also human categorization is and this in turn yes it's a language it's a ling uh, he's talking about language but this in turn can pro can promote in us a more inclusive approach a more um, a more flexible approach to understand diversity to understand even cultural differences um, it has an ethical dimension to it that perhaps is not as immediately apparent with other approaches to language and to philosophy. And the, the ethical consideration, you know, the, the acknowledgement that concepts don't have rigid boundaries, rigid edges, but they're part of human practices. They invite, they, they invite from us a reconsideration um, of how we make ethical judgments, of how we understand moral concepts. You know, they introduce grey 
in our lives, which is really fundamental, I think. Too often we fail, we, we, too, too often we fall victims to black and white thinking. And when you do logic, when you do fallacies, you notice that this is one of the fallacies we unfortunately fall in very often. Black and white thinking, right? We think that to be something, you have to not be something else. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a position of extremities. It's, a, it's an extreme position. You have to be this because this is what you essentially are. Therefore, you can't be something else. Um, but again, what Wittgenstein introduces with his family of resemblances, with his philosophical investigations, is this ethical consideration of grey areas, of the grey that is so important for us to lead meaningful lives. Um, it's, um, it helps us to understand a bit better that there are so many contexts, that there are so many forms of life, forms of life in a Wittgensteinian sense, right? These backdrops against which we see the world. We are defined by these forms of life. We're defined in our meaning of family resemblance of words we're, we're defined by the, the, the context etc um, so how we practice language within these forms of lives if we keep in mind that it's all language games at the end of the day we also made more aware more ethically considered um, of other people we're more tolerant to ambiguity and by ambiguity i mean um, um i mean a tolerance for the complexity of what makes us humans at the end of it i believe that's the end of this lecture